welcome you all to the lecture series on corporate law the present lecture will be dealt with regard to the chapter 25 or uh, chapter 15 of the companies act which deals compromises arrangements and amalgamations this subject is also very famously known as mergers and amalgamations the subject of mergers and amalgamation is scattered into the various legislations namely chapter 15 of the companies act and section 5 and 6 of the competition act then third one is the sebi takeover code regulations 2011 the present lecture i would like to throw the basic understanding, the basic premise of the subject from the lenses on from the guidance and the, from the view of the Companies Act 2013. So I will be dealing the provisions of section right section 230 onwards because there are 10 provisions of company law which deals under the compromises, arrangements and amalgamations. Now, when you try to understand the literal meaning of the compromise and arrangement, in the Companies Act, we don't find the definition of compromise and arrangement. The definitions are not there. However, the practice is that there are compromises among the certain class and classes of the members, certain class and classes of the shareholders. And there is also one of the uh, misconception, do we require a dispute before the compromise? As far as the Companies Act is concerned, you don't require a dispute for the purpose of compromise under the Companies Act. This is what they try to explain by looking into the uh, commentaries under the Companies Act. Here I just try to explain, I try to put it in some light on the terminology of Chapter 15 of the Companies Act, which deals on compromises and arrangements. And the meaning of arrangement is also not defined. Arrangement basically a type of a scheme drafted among the shareholders or maybe the creditors and that scheme or any arrangement what happens among the members of the company for restructuring of the companies we call as the arrangements and the definition of amalgamations right let us see the definition of amalgamation under chapter 15 of the companies act Companies Act is very silent on the amalgamations and the definitions as is concerned. As far as the definition of the amalgamation is defined under Section 2, Class 1B of the Income Tax Act defines amalgamation in relation to companies means the merger of one or more or companies with another company or the merger of two or more companies to form another companies. So it is a language which talks a merger of one or two companies or more than one or two companies forming one. Let us take the a small understanding of this particular subject. Say for example, X Limited. This is the balance sheet of the company. You are having the liabilities. You have the assets. Then you have the Y limited. There again, you are having the liabilities. Then you have the assets. Now company law talks in such a way, company and its shareholders, right? Company and its shareholders, company and its creditors, or a group of creditors may form for the scheme of arrangement or for the restructuring of companies. I will try to read the language. I will try to explain the same uh, terminology by the balance sheet. 
the language of the Companies Act, if we see Section 230 of the Companies Act, Section 230 of the Companies Act deals where a compromise or arrangement is proposed between a company, its creditors or any class of them. Let us see this particular phrase by taking the example just now which I prepared here. Company and the shareholders or maybe the class of the shareholders, they form a compromise or they can form as the arrangements. Second subclass, a company between its members or any class of them. So in a simple understanding is that a company, right, a company among the shareholders, among the creditors, they can form a particular scheme of arrangement. We call it as scheme of compromise, scheme of arrangements. So if there is an arrangement among the members of the company, then all of us have a doubt. What is this arrangement of the companies? The arrangement may be in such a nature. The shareholders of this company may be shifting to this company. Creditors can go to this particular company. There is a possibility X limited company plus Y limited company only Y limited can exist, X limited can go for the dissolution. This is one of the example I am giving. Kindly remember, there are various restructures in the corporate law. One of the examples which I am taking, that members of this company can form an agreement whereby they want to transfer themselves to the Y limited or these people also can have an agreement, right? The restructuring of the companies. The restructuring of the companies, what we mean it called as the shareholders or the creditors may sit together, may form for the purposes of the scheme of arrangements, scheme of what we call amalgamations. This subject is also called by another name that is called as restructuring of companies. There are two types of restructures. One is about the internal reconstruction. Second one is the external reconstructions. So try to remember, we also call the subject called the external reconstruction or external restructuring of the company or sometimes we also call internal reconstruction of the companies. We also use one more terminology, corporate debt restructuring. So what is this restructures? You are restructuring something that means there is a, some structure. The structure of the company is the balance sheet. If there is something is which is going to change on the balance sheet of the companies where the company may transfer its assets and liabilities to another company, where the company can transfer its business to another company, both may exist together or they may create the new joint venture companies or otherwise also. So therefore, the company law provides under section 230 of the Companies Act what the language says, power to compromise or make arrangement with the creditors and members. Now let us try to understand section 230 of the Companies Act deals with regard to the power to compromise or make arrangement with the creditors and the members. So where a compromise or arrangement is proposed between a company and its creditors or any class of them, between a company and its members or any class of them, the tribunal may on the application of a company Application can be filed by company or by creditor or by member. So that's what you find it here. Application of the company, number one, application of any creditor or application of any member, number three, of the company. In the case of the company which is being wound up, wound up the liquidator, that is number four is the liquidator, order a meeting of creditors of the class of creditors or the members of the class of members as the case may be called 
held and conducted in such a manner as the tribunal directs. So when you read this provisio or the explanation under section 230, the tribunal can pass an order on the request received by the members of the company, creditors of the company, as well as the uh, company itself, then they can pass an order to go for the restructuring. Kindly remember, the application has to be filed either by the members or by the creditors. Kindly remember, company law is very silent as far as the compromises and arrangements are concerned. When one company will merge with another companies. The gray areas of the company law, say for example, there is X limited, there is a B limited and also Y limited. Some of us may have a doubt, sir, when that X limited can merge with the B limited or when B limited can merge with the Y limited or Y limited with the X limited, is there any circumstances, right? Is there any circumstances where it is being laid down, right? Where it is being, it is being laid down in company law for the purpose of what is called about the amalgamations. The company law is very much silent to understand about the circumstances. But company law talks with regard on the premise that, the premise what they are providing is that the, when there is an application, in the case of the applications, then they talk about the, the application process and in the application, the powers of the court as well as the other members. So try to remember under section 230 of the Companies Act that a compromise or arrangement is proposed. And I want to tell one more thing. The chapter of section 230 to the 234 is both substantial clause as well as the procedural clause. As a lawyer or a company secretary or the chartered accountant, if you want to file a petition for compromises and arrangements under section 230, this is comes as a procedural clause. You will file your petition under section 230. So kindly remember chapter 15 of the Companies Act is both substantial clause as well as the procedural clause. You don't require to take the help of any other laws. Under section 230 itself, you can file the petitions. Now, in the same provision, under subclause number C, it says, any scheme for corporate debt restructuring, we call as CDR, consented by not less than 75% of secured creditors. So that means a person's more than 75%. If the secured creditors have consented, you can go for the corporate debt restructuring. And the creditor responsibility statement in the prescribed form, safeguards for the protection of other secured and unsecured creditors, report by the auditor that the fund requirements of the company after the CDRs as approval shall conform to the liquidity test based upon the estimation. You will find another terminology called liquidity test. We will discuss on the CDRs in another special lecture. Uh, this lecture is only uh, on the fundamental basics of the section 230, right? This lecture is only the fundamental basics of the section 230. So when we read the other sub clauses, we will read the elaborately on the further provisions. Now the section 231, power of the tribunal to enforce the compromise or arrangement. Where the tribunal makes an order under section 230, sanctioning a compromise or an arrangement in respect of a company, it shall have the power to supervise the implementation of the compromise or arrangement. So the power of the tribunal is only a supervisory jurisdictions, right? 
whether the procedure has been followed or not. If the tribunal is satisfied, the compromise or arrangement under section 230 cannot be implemented satisfactorily with or without modification and the company is unable to pay its debts as per the scheme, it can make an order for a winding up of the company and such an order shall be deemed an order under section 230 of the Companies Act. This is a very important clause. Even the time of scheme of amalgamation, the tribunal has the power for the closing of the company called winding up of the companies. A company can be dissolved when the company fails to pay the debts, when the company is unable to pay its money back. So, in the case of the section 230 and 231, that there is a possibility that the disappearance of existence of one of the companies. So kindly remember this logic that the power of the tribunal, number one is a supervisory jurisdiction, number two is with regard to the sanctioning of the uh, powers with regard to the winding up. In the case where the company fails or where the company is unable to pay back is the debts. Section 232. In the section 232, you file the language of merger and amalgamations. I will recollect your memories again. Section 230, you read the language of compromise and arrangement. That is the section 230. Section 232, you read the language of merger and amalgamations. So there are four forms of the restructures. Number one, what we can see, compromise. Two is about the arrangements. Three is about the merger. Four is about the amalgamations. Right? We find about the three terminologies, one under the 230, the other two under the 232. Put it these four in one particular umbrella. We call all these as reconstruction right reconstruction otherwise we call as the restructuring of companies so kindly remember the broader terminology when you talk about the restructure and reconstruction of the companies whenever there is the restructures reconstruction of the companies the byproducts of the subject is about the tax loss and other is about the other liabilities. We will discuss what the legal issues comes in the case of reconstructions. Now let us see about the section 232. Where an application is made to the tribunal under 230. What is there in 230? 230 is about compromise and arrangement. For sanctioning of a compromise or an arrangement proposed between a company and any such persons as are mentioned in the section and it is shown to the tribunal that the compromise or arrangement has been proposed for the purpose of or in connection with a scheme for reconstruction of the company or companies involving a merger or the amalgamation of any two or more companies. The same text you will find from the Income Tax Act. What it says, the compromise or arrangement has been proposed for the purpose of or in connection with a scheme for reconstruction of the company or a company's involving merger or amalgamation of two or more companies and under this scheme, the whole or any part of undertaking property or liabilities of any company referred as transfer or company is required to be transferred to another company called as a transferee company and proposed to be divided among the transfer among the two or more companies. Let us take a small example what we see here that is called A Limited is transferring to the B Limited which we call as the transfer our company and also 
transfer company what can be transfer between transferor to the transfer company there can be a possibility transferor company transfers everything to transfer company and transfer company can also go for the dissolutions so try to understand the language what the act is providing about the restructuring of the companies so under section 232 the language which is or the jurisprudence which comes out is that the connection of the companies with a scheme for the reconstruction of the company or the companies involving a merger and also the transfer of the whole or any part of undertaking this also we use a different name is the demergers from the transferor company to the transferee company where they divide the properties among the their group of companies to understand section 232 in the simple language that is called about the merger and amalgamations dealt under section 232 of the companies act if the application is filed under section 230 asking these remedies are the uh, what is called the uh, scheme which is provided under 232 and court has a power to get the scheme of amalgamations merger under 232. Now let us see the powers of the tribunal. Once we file a petition before a tribunal, what the tribunal has to do? Now under the same proviso, the tribunal powers are given. The tribunal means MCLT, that is National Company or Tribunal, where the jurisdiction is prescribed. The companies are supposed to file before the National Company or Tribunals. The tribunal, after satisfying that, procedure specified in the subsection 1 and 2 has been compiled with may by order sanction the compromise or arrangement by subsequent order make provision for the following matters namely transfer to the transfer company of all or any part of the undertaking property or liabilities of the transfer or company from the date to be determined by the parties unless the tribunal for reasons unless the tribunal for reasons to be recorded by it in writing decides otherwise I am using the text of the language to make acquaint all of you to the legal text. The transfer of assets and liabilities of the transfer or company will be given to the transferee company unless otherwise expressly provides some other mechanisms. Point number B, the allotment or appropriation by the transferee company of any shares, debentures, policies or other like instruments in the company which under the compromise or arrangement are apported to be company for another person that means a limited and b limited all the issues of a limited will be transferred to the b limited either it may be the shares or maybe the debentures or maybe the other type of assets like you can have an example now if I take the some live example, uh, for example, all of we know Vodafone and Idea mergers. So both are existing. Still we have the company comes Vodafone I. We have another company case, Hindustan Lever Limited. Later it has been acquired by Hindustan Unilever. So Hindustan in the Lever Limited is renamed as the Hindustan Unilever Limited. So like we find across the globe varieties of companies are where there are a lot of companies which we find about the on daily basis lot of acquisitions are happening business is being transformed. If we take any recent one like for example Air India right Air India is being taken over by Tata groups. Now Air India is not there. Right? All the Air India assets and liabilities are given to Tata group. Tata group paid the lump sum amount and thereafter 
it has been approved so when you look about these complete mergers of the companies they are being permitted under the uh, regulations and the laws where you can have the different remedies that is where when you find the powers of the tribunal the tribunal is given the uh, different powers where the transfer of assets and liabilities to law will also will happen to one company to another company then other one then provided that transfer company shall not as a result of compromise or arrangement hold any shares in its own name or in the any name of trust whether on its behalf or on behalf on behalf of any of its subsidiary or associate companies and such shares shall be cancelled or extinguished point number c continuation of or continuation by or against the transfer company of any legal proceedings pending by or against any transfer or company on the date of transfers so some of the proceedings has to be decided whether it will transfer to another company or will be continuing then another important point is the dissolution of the company without winding up of the transfer company transfer or companies this is very simple a limited merges with the b limited a limited becomes disappears this is what we call 100% absorption the name can be a b limited or it can be also called as ab limited or you can say ba limited the name can be different but they disappear from the company law they disappear from the existence of its own name so it is very important to try to understand without going for the chapter of the winding up a company can be dissolved that means a company can uh, dissolve its identity without approaching to the uh, under the chapter of the winding up chapter a company can get dissolution under the uh, chapter on the amalgamations and mergers kindly remember this provision sometimes it comes in the practical life examples uh, what will happen to the one nature of the company or existence of a company when the new company comes in existence or one company merges with the another companies and another one is that the provision to be made by for any persons within such time in such a manner tribunal directs dissent from the compromise or arrangements this is a very important concept say for example a limited is merging with the b limited there are 5000 shareholders in a limited who are not interested to go to this particular b limited what will happen to this 5000 shareholders because there may be a total number of shareholders say for example 50000 shareholders out of 50000 shareholders 45000 shareholders are interested to go 5000 shareholders are not interested this we call as dissenting shareholders so the company law provides kindly provide some provision to protect the interest of the dissenting shareholders when you make the compromises as well as the arrangements dissenting shareholders end of the day either they should stay with the company or if they don't like they should come exit therefore what will happen in exit option they will be provided the fair price point number b f where the share capital is held by non resident shareholder under the fdi norms of the rbi will come so this you don't require immediately as of now because the shareholders in nri in indian companies what will happen to that transfer of employees of transfer or company to the transferee companies this also a very famous case we are having we will discuss in the next slide with regard to the hindustan unilever versus hindustan labor limited when there is a transfer of one company to another company uh, the major company will tell the employees will also being transferred to the another company 
sometimes employees may be interested sometimes employees are not interested in the case if the employees are not interested what will happen end of the day uh, it is very simple the majority will prevail and if the employee is interested to transfer and join with another company it is fine enough if the employee is not interested to transfer if the employee is not interested to uh, transfer to himself or herself to the transfer company automatically you will be removed from the employment point number h where the transferer company is a listed company and the transferee company is unlisted company the transferee shall remain as unlisted until it becomes a listed companies uh, this point number basically comes where the sebi comes in existence you don't require as of now what is the rule applicable to the uh, listed companies to the unlisted companies the other provision if the shareholders of the transferer company decide to opt out the transferee company provision shall be made for the payment of value of the shares held by them and other benefits in accordance with the predetermined price formula in accordance with the free predetermined predetermined price formula or after a valuation is made and the arrangements under the provisions may be made by the tribunals so basically the provisions which are talking under section 232 the tribunal has the power to pass all these orders right to pass all these orders or they can also pass any one of the orders so kindly remember the tribunal has the power to pass all these orders or it can also pass any one of these orders now section 233 merger or amalgamation of certain companies it pass about the a special class of companies under section 233 where it says not withstanding anything in the 230 and 232 a scheme of merger and amalgamation may be entered into between two or more small companies are holding company or only owned company subsidiary company of such other classes can be done so section 233 basically applies to the small companies or the other class of companies other class of companies so end of the day companies act applies for the amalgamations and merger of the companies irrespective of the natures section 234 merger or amalgamation of company with the foreign company so the provisions of this particular chapter that is chapter 15 of the companies act 2013 will apply mutas mutandis that means as equal to the it applies to other provisions so automatically the merger will also applies to the companies which is called as the foreign mergers or companies which has implication of the foreign merger companies now section 240 right from 234 i am in the 240 the 235 onwards 235 right 235 236 is about the descending shareholder we will discuss elaborately for another class section 240 section 240 talks liability of officers in respect of offenses committed prior to the merger or amalgamations so not withstanding anything in any other law not withstanding anything in any other law for the time being in force the liability in respect of the offenses committed under this act by the offenses in the officers in default of the transferor company prior to its merger and amalgamation or acquisition shall continue after such merger amalgamation or also after the acquisitions so the simple point merging of company 
will not absolve, will not vitiate the liabilities of the officers who are held liable even prior to the mergers. If there is a wrong which was committed by the officers and the officers are liable even after the mergers. So merger cannot be used as a device. Merger cannot be used as a deceptive device to defraud the investors to avoid the liability under any principles of law. I will repeat again. A merger cannot be used as a ground or a mechanism to defraud the members, to defraud the investors or to escape from the liability. So if a, there is an offense, if there is a wrongful act under the Companies Act, the people who committed the wrong are liable and responsible for their wrongful acts. Kindly remember this logic. Now I try to discuss the continuation of this particular case, uh, in the particularly amalgamation mergers. I want to discuss two case laws which are well known in amalgamations. That is the Hindustan Lever Employees Union versus Hindustan Limited. Because this was a case of 1995 Supreme Court judgment where there was an international acquisitions and mergers. The employees union raised an objection before the Supreme Court. Some of the employees refused to transfer themselves. However, court refused to interfere. Court tried to establish, right? The court tried to establish what is the role of the court in the case of amalgamations and mergers. Let us see the statement given by Honorable Justice Venkata Chalaya, the, Chief, the then Chief Justice of Supreme Court, where he has said with regard to the power of the court, right? The power of the court. It says, what was lost sight was the, what was lost sight of was that the jurisdiction of the court in sanctioning of a claim of merger is not ascertained with mathematical accuracy if the determination satisfies arithmetical test. Arithmetical test means if the resolution is passed with a three-fourth majority, it is done. That's all. If the arithmetical test means in company law, the decisions are taken by passing of resolutions by majority of the people. Once you have the majority of people and decisions are passed, that becomes a final. That's what called arithmetical test. A company does not exercise appellate jurisdiction. Now here I want to refer your attention, right? This is the judgment of 1995. Now let us see the same language which has been used in the company's law uh, under the section 234 let me put it right the what it says liquidity test powers now power of the court responsibility liquidity test rbi supervise we see the power of the court is the supervise so the language of the supreme court judgment of 1995 is reflected in section 231 of the companies act that is why we have to read the judgments of Supreme Court. How the judgments of Supreme Court are the jurisprudence laid, by the, laid down by the jurisprudence laid down by courts of in India becoming the part and provisions of law, becoming the language of the text of law. So the Supreme Court said in the 1995 itself, it does not exercise an appellate jurisdiction it has only supervisory jurisdiction. Section 394 is a correlated of Section 230 of Companies Act 2013. It says an obligation on the court to be satisfied that the scheme for amalgamation or merger was not contrary to public interest. The basic principle of such satisfaction is none other than the 
broad and general principle inherent in any compromise or settlement entered between the parties that it should not be unfair or contrary to public policy or unconscionable in amalgamation of companies the court evolved the principle called prudent businessman test that is called pbmt right pbmt test or the scheme has to be devised should not be devised to evade the law if the business people they evolved the test if the business people and wisdom applying of their wisdom if they have taken a decision kindly allow them to do their own business courts are not there to interfere then in the business court will not tell how to do the business court will only tell how to follow the procedures in the continuation the same one they also try to explain about the another principles now i am taking another judgment meharaj maftalal industry versus maftalal industry this is the landmark case on the jurisprudence of powers of the court with regard to the amalgamations and mergers now what it has been said in one of the books of company law the author name is buckley in his book on 14th editions what he says in exercising the power of the sanction of the court the court will see first that the provisions of statute have been compiled with second the class was fairly represented by those who attended the meeting and he is statutory majority are acting the bona fide and not coercing the minority in order to promote the interest adverse to those of the class whom they propose to represent and thirdly the arrangement is intelligent and honest man a member of the class concerned and acting in respect of his interest might reasonably approve the court does not sit merely on the majority that majority are acting bona fide and register the decision of the meetings but at the same time court will be slow to defer meeting unless the class has not been properly consulted so the point here is that the court is only there to supervise the court only will see whether they applied intelligently and the decisions of honest man applications now i want to analyze the powers of the court which was laid down in the maftalal industries case the principles laid down in maftalal industries case is the law even in the 2022 so i have taken the nine points which was laid down the powers of the tribunal and the maftalal industries we will discuss those principles the first one is that whether the procedure has been followed while granting or while approving the merger and amalgamation or not that is the first provision second provision whether the procedure whether majority has been consulted or not that is the second provision number 3 whether the members or the creditors have informed about the material facts and whether the creditors and members have taken informed decisions that is very important informed decisions are very important how to take informed decisions and the majority decisions of the concerned class of voters is just fair to the class as a whole so as to legitimately blind on even descending members of that particular class legitimately bind actually so that's what they point about the minority shareholders rights point number 4 the votes have been taken in consideration or not that was the point number 4 necessary material facts because sometimes what will happen if the meeting is called and the management of the company 
may not be providing the required documents. So they may be provided the documents which are not necessary because of which the members may not be taken proper decisions. So therefore it has come that they must be provided necessary documents. Point number five, uh, the requisite material contemplated by the provision of subsection 2 of section 391 of the act is placed before the court by the concerned applicant seeking sanction for such a scheme and the court gets satisfied about the same. Point number six, that the proposed scheme of compromise is not violative of any provisions of law, not contrary to public policy. For entertaining this one, it is only there judicially x-ray the same. So they will apply the, the court has to see that whether the process has been followed, whether the purpose is proper or not, that they do the process. Point number seven, that the company court has also to satisfy itself that members or class of members or creditors or class of creditors as the case may be were acting bona fide and in good faith and not coercing the minority to promote any interest adverse to that of the later compromising of the same class whom they propose to represent. So it's something called a minority interest has to be protected. Minority should be, minority should not be coerced by the majority. Point number eight, again the PMBT test, the commercial decision beneficial to the class represented by them for whom the scheme is meant. That is also a very important point. Point number nine, a court will not sit on the commercial wisdom of the, right? Commercial wisdom of businessman. So this is what comes under the logic of the mergers. If the commercial wisdom is there, then court has to sanction invariably. Unless otherwise, there is a coercion, there is a violation of public policy, or there are some other issues were there, then court will ask them, go back to your management, you discuss again, come back to us. Court cannot refuse the sanction on the ground it would be otherwise amount to the court exercising an appellate, appellate jurisdiction over the scheme rather a supervisory jurisdictions. So court is simply there as the supervisory jurisdiction. I thought in the today's class to discuss uh, the recent merger of Amazon versus Future Retail. All of you may know the future retail dispute is going on. Recently, Supreme Court has ordered to have an arbitration clause among the settlement of their issues. So like that, you will find very number of cases where there is the a cases comes before the court of law and court always try to interfere to provide the justice for the minority shareholders and also to provide the justice to the other shareholders, other members. So this is very basic on amalgamations and mergers. In this chapter, what I try to discuss is that the provisions of section 230 and 231, 232, followed by 234 and 235. And also I try to explain power of the tribunal, right? Power of the tribunal or the court with regard to the amalgamations and mergers. I try to explain in the same lecture the amalgamations which are defined under the Income Tax Act. In the next lecture, I will try to explain amalgamations from the Accounting Standard 14. Right? Accounting Standards 
accounting standard 14 also discuss about the amalgamations and merges i will take another class under the amalgamations from the perspective of accounting standard 14 then we will try to understand because amalgamations are dealt under the companies act accounting standards takeover code and the competition act i try to explain in this lecture a brief basics of the amalgamation under section 230 of the companies act hope some of you will understand if any one of you have any clarifications try to write in the chat box i will try to clarify your doubts in the further lectures thank you for patient listening thank you one and all take care